and it's their intrinsic nature. It's cool, basically. Sound, sound, like sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Thanks for watching. Now, when you pay attention to the economic situation in the African American community, you can see clearly, and this is like common sense, you can see clearly that every race that comes into the black community gets rich off the black community. Everybody is making money. That money stays in the black community, as I mentioned before, for about six to eight hours before it leaves. You have to understand all these races of people, all these groups of people that are not us are taking that money back to their, you know, their uh, communities, back into their economy and, you know, stimulating their economy and keeping their people uh, out of poverty and, you know, in mansions and in nice homes. African-Americans, the African-American community has put more children white children, Asian children through college than we have put our own kids through college. We have created more white and Hispanic and Asian multimillionaires than we have created, you know, black people that got, you know, $100,000. And this is something that we really have to look at and understand the buying power. I know everybody talks about this and say, well, black people buy so much and we spend so much money. I mean, this is not a thing that we're saying. You got to realize this. You have a situation where we are being leeched off, where everybody else is blood sucking leeches and we are just this one body that everybody is feeding from and they are eating good. And the problem with that is we are not able to sustain ourselves, you know, because everybody is leeching off the black community. The issue is we allow them to. We can stop all of this. We can change the flow of wealth from us to them and keep it within our community. But we got to understand first how this thing works. Now, in previous videos, I've talked about how, you know, integration really hurt black businesses in the 60s. Before integration, before we was allowed to actually go to these other places and shop and spend our dollars, you had the dollar staying in the black community, you know, for months because we wasn't allowed to go spend it really anywhere else. And a lot of times we didn't want to go to the white shops and to these white stores because of, you know, the whole racial issue. And black people felt more comfortable spending their dollars within their community. So the dollar stayed and it circulated. You know, not everybody back then was doing well and had, you know, good businesses and stuff like that. But for the most part, you had a lot of African-Americans who was doing okay because the money that came from the black community went right back into the black community. And we started to build success from that. And then another problem was since, you know, some people were poor and were on welfare, this really hurt the economy overall. Let's just say the white economy. Now, remember, Reagan gave a speech. I showed this in a previous video about how the economy wasn't doing so well. This is right before they ended Jim Crow and everything. And the thing is, you had black people who was poor, who was on welfare. And the issue was you had black people taking this welfare from the government, this government money, and not putting it back in the white economy. We was putting it back in a black community. So we basically getting money from Uncle Sam, taking his money, spending it in the black community, and then staying within the black community, thereby, you know, boosting the black uh, economy and not, you know, the white community. And of course, 
they caught on to that. That wasn't going to last too long. They giving us money and we we using it to better ourselves. So integration was a must. They couldn't just cancel um, welfare for the black community. So it was something that had to be done that they had to integrate. So all that money that these poor black people was getting wasn't going back into the black community, but they could spend it, you know, on white shops and white restaurants and spend it to help stimulate the white community. So I want you to understand this whole thing from like a, you know, an economic standpoint, from a business standpoint. Most black people back then, the only jobs they can get if they didn't own their own company or their own business or whatever like that was working for the white man, working for white people, housekeeping or cleaning the streets or shining shoes or what have you. Now, think about this. We working for the white man, taking the white man's money, bringing it back to the black community and building wealth, building success off of their money. One race, some race, has to be the economic source of funds. You know, if we keep only spending money within our community, then that money is just circulating within our community. We need to bring in some outside money to boost the economy in our community, to boost the economic situation in our community. So think about it. If our economy as black people only has, let's just say, you know, $10 million. That $10 million is going to keep circulating within the community. We got to bring in some outside money to add to that $10 million we got. So if we all got $10 million, let's just say, split between us, and I go shop in this black store in the black community, all I'm doing is just spreading around the $10 million that we already had as a people. It's not really uh, generating any wealth for the community as a whole. So even though you had, let's say, two million and I came to you and I spent two hundred thousand, now you got two million two hundred thousand, but it's still within that ten million within the black community, if you understand what I'm saying. What you have to do is you have to go and bring money from outside the community and bring it in. So then that way everybody has this split of the ten million, but now we just bought in another ten million and double our money. So now we could do more as an economy. So understand, where are you going to get this other 10 million from? One race has to be, one group of people has to be the race or the people who is going to fund your community growing. Because before they came in and spent their money, you had one source of money. You had one, you know, economic source that was funding your your uh your economy. So yeah, the government comes in sometimes and puts in money for certain things like roads and stuff like that. But even still, you know, that's budgeted for and you don't look at that as, you know, contributing. So after desegregation, after Jim Crow ended, you make it so now African Americans, black people can come into the white community and spend money. It's just not economically smart to keep us out when we have such buying power. Even back then, this is a whole nother race of people bringing in funds to that white economy, boosting the economy. Forget all the hate shit. This is business. And it's something that a lot of white people didn't really understand at first, but they begin to understand. Use these Negroes, use these black people to make yourself wealthy. And that's exactly what happened when they ended the whole Jim Crow thing. So now they said, OK, after years of hate, after years of slavery and everything else, they said, y'all can come here and y'all can shop. We went and let y'all piss where we piss or drink off the same fountain as us. But now y'all can come chill with us. Y'all can shit with us and everything else. Just bring me your money so I can get wealthy and move far away from you where I don't have to see you no more. And that's basically what happened. So now they gave black people this false sense of, you know, finally we can belong. We can do the same thing as they can do. And you seen back then in the 50s and 60s, you know, after, um, you know, integration and everything, you seen it back then. Remember, a lot of black people was walking around with those, you know, slick hairdos and suits standing on the corner, 
trying to be accepted by white America, trying to fit in with having, you know, to come into white America, come into the white community to work or to shop, to try to fit in and try to, you know, be accepted. And of course, we know that didn't work. We still got beat up. No matter how we looked, they didn't care. It was a, you know, business first thing. This is business, you know, and we still hate you niggas. We just want your money. And this is something you got to understand. And that's one of the things I really want to get into in this video so you can realize that there has to be a people to stimulate your economy. And this is what we have done for, you know, decades now. We continue still to this day to do it, to boost the economy. Now, you look at the news and you look at all the people talking about the numbers of how, you know, the wealth gap between African-Americans and white people and this and that. We are to blame for that. We are to blame for that because of ignorance, because of stubbornness, and because we simply don't want to accept what we already know. And that is the fact that they are not going to let us simply surpass them in wealth and success. They're not going to let it happen. You can sit and stand in line for hours and vote for whoever you want to vote for. It's not going to happen. The only way it's going to happen is if we come together collectively and say we are not going to shop here. We're not going to spend our money with you. And this is the problem. We keep spending our money and building their economy and breaking down ours. Now, you got to understand they have successfully with integration and with you know desegregation. They have successfully destroyed the black business, got rid of it, crippled it because now they said, OK, Y'all can come here and shop. Y'all can spend your money. So what you have is you have all those black businesses having to compete with those white businesses who got, you know, way better product, way more variety. And it wasn't that, you know, the black stores was trying to cheat black people. It's because it was they didn't have the same access to the same things, of course, as the white business owners. And it is what it is. A person want what they want. You want to spend your money on something that's, you know, quality we didn't think about it as how it would really affect the economy or us as a whole so we basically when you think about it when you look at it this way you had us bottled into this one area you know black people spending money together living together we was united by the, the simple fact that they hated us and they said we can't do this we can't do that and we was driven by that to the point where we wanted to succeed and surpass them. And that's what we started to do. But as soon as they said, okay, y'all can come here. You know, we left this area and we basically spread out to where you had some black people stay in the black community. You had a lot of people go in between. And the ones who could afford now to go live in a white community, they did so. Because it's something deep down in black people, you know, due to slavery, Epigenome, I like to always talk about, that slave gene that wants to be accepted by master. You want to be accepted by these white people. It's something inside of us, not all of us, because I don't give a shit, that wants to be accepted by them. And that's what it was back then. So since so many people wanted to be accepted and now they had the opportunity to go out and be success successful and try to fit in with these white folks, that's what they did. So, I mean, when you look at it from, a, I'm going to just say a strictly ignor ignorance standpoint, not calling anybody stupid, just saying they had no clue. I mean, when you when you living in a world where everything that is good is white, everything that you hope and dream and want for, you see white people have it. When you live in a situation like that, where white people have all the power and it's really not much you can do. You can't really blame a people. You can't blame those people for wanting to just fit in and to be accepted so that they can have a chance to be successful and reach their dreams. Now, of course, as you can imagine, this was confusing for a lot of black people. You got to realize some black folks back then never set foot out of the black community for a lot of reasons, you know, but they was forced to as they got older, you know, to go out and get jobs or to to go somewhere and do something that was important that they had to go through a white community. But a lot of people grew up and, you know, that was teenagers or in their 20s, like in the 40s and 50s, 
that a lot of people just stayed in the black community because why would you want to go to a white community or go near a white community where you could get lynched or beat up or called names or spit on and stuff like that? This was something that a lot of people was fearing back then. And, and it's weird because this is one of the reasons why I like speaking to old people. I'm telling you, if you have a chance to really talk to somebody who lived back then, do it. It's going to blow your mind, especially from a, you know, historical or, you know, scholarly scholarship type of position. T talk to these people. They got some stories. I used to always ask my mom questions, you know, about back then and, um, you know, how things was and how she felt. And a lot of old people I spoke to who lived through segregation, who remember seeing Dr. King on TV. I mean, just think about that. They have that memory, you know, and hearing them explain how things was and how the signs, you know, can you imagine that whites own blacks own how that was, you know, interacting with white people and going to certain neighborhoods. And it's an amazing conversation to have with a black person who's lived, who's lived through that or a white person, even who's lived through that, who can tell you from a different perspective of how things was and how messed up things was. So, of course, you understand a lot of black people was confused. They never been out of the black community, some of them. And then, you know, once integration happened, a lot of them was forced to go to white schools and, you know, work with white people and things like that. It was something that really, you know, shook up the people and they really didn't know how to deal with that emotionally. Fortunately for us, we had people like, you know, Malcolm X, who didn't really want to bow down to that whole system. You know, we had Dr. King and Dr. King was pushing for the whole, you know, whole hands and integration and everything like that. And just, you know, really respect. But me, I'm not Muslim, of course, but, if, you know, I, I pushed more towards Malcolm X, whole, his whole reasoning for, you know, we want respect. We want to build our own business. We're going to do our own thing. You know, we was doing well. Y'all come in here messing with us. Let us be successful because, as I said before, I think we would have got more respect as a people had we built our own economy and built our own wealth from our, you know, ourselves instead of, you know, mixing with white people and mixing with the white community and having to depend on them and depend on the government system to build wealth. And this was the issue. And this is the whole key to this whole thing, because this is actually what happened. The speeches Malcolm X gave, the stuff he talked about back then was on point. Him and a few other people. It's on point when you really pay attention. You have to now, now unbeknownst to black people, use them. So basically what they were saying back then is we need y'all black folks. We ain't going to tell y'all that. We need y'all to come and work for us to work more. You have to realize the jobs, the positions that now was created because black people was integrating. You had to, you know, create jobs to deal with black people, all the new black uh, people that was going to be coming into your shops and your stores. You got to hire people, you know. So this, it created, you know, a plethora of jobs for white people everywhere. So now you got more white people being employed who wasn't employed because of integration. So that's now white people making money. And you had black businesses now going under more white businesses coming up and strengthening from black dollars. So when we talk about the, the African-American community and our economy, you got to go back and look and see how integration and everything else strengthened their, their power, their reach. You know, it strengthened their whole community and their economy while really crippling ours when it was right on the verge of, you know, exploding into something very successful. Now, we always talk about Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street this, Black Wall Street that. A lot of people always bring it up, especially me. I know I bring it up a lot, but I always give you, you know, a good explanation to why I bring it up. But you got to look at how Black Wall Street became successful. I mean, pay attention to it. How do you think they was able to build that kind of wealth? You had a whole community, not just a community, almost, you know, a whole town, a bunch of black people trading wealth. But not just that going outside of the black community and bringing in white money, you know, bringing in uh, money from successful business transactions. And it was able to 
take the profits from that and, you know, make new stuff, buy planes and, you know, uh, open more businesses and movie theaters. And what Black Wall Street was, was the blueprint for African-American success. And I guarantee you, we were following up on that. It would have spread. I keep telling you, no matter what we do, we are successful. Whenever we get together and do anything, we become unstoppable. And they understand that. This is why we have so many hurdles in our way now. Because if we ever get united and put our heads together, more than anybody else, we coming out on top. And it's something that they know. So there's so much in place to keep that from happening. When you want to talk about an economy, an economic situation as far as black people, such a thing cannot exist. And it's just keeping it real. It can't happen. And you don't see it happen. Look around at every other race. Everybody has something. You got Mexicans who got stores and restaurants and, you know, they have a culture. And from their culture, they can open restaurants and sell their food. You get what I'm saying? They do that. Same thing with Asians, Dominicans, white people. Everybody does that and has a situation where you go into a Chinatown or you go to, you know, Meadowville or, you know, Hispanic places and you go into, you know, uh, of course, the white community and you see all of this success and businesses and companies from these races of people. Where's ours? We don't have any of that. So you can see the reason why all of these uh, races thrive and are successful, because not only do their own race contribute to that success. We do as well. And all the other races as well. We come into, you know, the Asian community and we want to eat. We go to Chinatown and we eat. Now, when going into Chinatown and eating and spending our money, we are stimulating their economy. We're putting money that's not going to go back to our community, but it's going to go to theirs. Not saying that we can't go nowhere outside the black community and spend money. Cool. That's no problem. The problem is they're not coming into our community spending money that's going to benefit us. 